Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Paul, today we're going to be talking about primary aldosteronism on this short video and and the MRAs, spironolactone, aplerinone, if you will. But Paul, primary aldosteronism, I think most of our audience probably knows low renin, high aldosterone, checked in the morning, that should tip you off, especially if the person has resistant hypertension. But Paul, if we think we have a case, what else might we think about doing just to confirm the diagnosis and just to make sure we're not missing anything else? Yeah, I feel like we've we've been beating this drum for a while, but just as a reminder, it's probably more prevalent than had previously been recognized, and you're not necessarily going to see hypokalemia with it. So in the instance that you're talking about where you think you may have it, probably a good thing to check, well, even in cases of essential hypertension, is EKG. Dr. Luther talks about checking EKG, just to look for indirect evidence of structural disease, and if so, then he would chase down an echocardiogram. And then the other thing that he checks is a urinalysis for these patients. Again, good form in general, but he, he talks about how with bread and butter essential hypertension, you're not going to see necessarily a whole ton of proteinuria. Um, and with hyperaldosteronism, you're not going to see hematuria specifically. So you want to make sure that you're not missing a glomerular nephritis. If someone's blood pressure kind of falls off a cliff, you, you'd hate to be chasing down the hyperaldo. And then there's something else sort of intrinsic happening with the kidney that you're missing that could be averted. So he he does his due diligence with urinalysis um, just to make sure he's not missing any other potential renal causes of hypertension. Yeah, a rapid rise in creatinine with the hypertension, hematuria, things like that. You know, you got to worry about it, glomerular nephritis. He also said even, especially if they had an adenoma, um, he would be he'd be checking, like, you don't want to miss a Cushing. So we talked about on a prior episode, DHEA sulfate, sending that um, as maybe a first line, and then doing the dexamethasone suppression test if this DHEA sulfate, you know, is suggestive. So... I think uh, thinking about those things is also important. And Paul, you know, with the we talked about the urinalysis, the proteinuria. The other thing is the kidney function. So should we freak out if the if the creatinine goes up once we start someone on treatment for primary aldosteronism? I, you know, it's it's man, I'm going to freak out. <laughs> but, <laughs> Me too, but, probably. Yeah, our guest kind of reassured us a little bit, or maybe reassured is not the right word, but did explain to us that that's, it's not uncommon at all, and you can see this sort of increase in creatinine um, once you actually control the, the blood pressure. You know, apparently, you're reversing some of the hyperfiltration you're seeing. You might have um, sort of an artificially preserved creatinine, and then once you actually manage the blood pressure appropriately, then it sort of unmasks this underlying chronic kidney disease that was probably there in the first place. Um, yeah. And he goes on to talk about how he, he tends to see these patients not progress as much to hemodialysis once you actually have the blood pressure controlled. So you might see right. this initial bump, but then it just kind of stays there. Not all the time, but yeah. that tends to be the overarching pattern that, that Dr. Luther sees. Yeah, the numbers he quoted were like, yeah, if I, I'm used to seeing maybe a creatinine go from 1.5 or 2 and goes up to 3, and then it just stays there. And he's like, I have some patients who are there for years. If I have a patient whose creatinine goes up by 1 or almost doubles, you know, I'm definitely going to be having a nephrologist holding my hand. Yep. But I... It is good to know that that's something expected to happen. And he made the point, even with your run-of-the-mill high blood pressure, when you control it, oftentimes you there you will often see a little bit of a creatinine bump, and then a stable, and then it'll stabilize. So, I I wouldn't want that to make people just pull everyone off the, the first line medications, which uh, in primary aldosteronism they're they're still going to need the first line medications, probably in addition to the to the MRA, because it can be very difficult to treat, and then. Uh, the, the last thing I wanted to mention, Paul, you know, talking about the treatment here, this that we are our main choices are spironolactone and aplerinone. Those are the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. And Paul, the dosing he taught he gave us there, uh, it's like twelve and a half. He, he said twelve and a half milligrams daily spironolactone, and then maybe go up to twenty five, up to fifty. In in many cases, uh, up to hundred milligrams might be needed, if especially if they have the bilateral hyperplasia. Um, and and they're not a candidate for surgery, then you you might be really having to have them on the frontline meds and the spironolactone, and really just keeping a close eye on that creatinine, on that potassium. Anything else you wanted to mention about spironolactone? We should talk about a plerinone as well. No, I just I wanted to mention for funny punsies, this is not a recommendation, by the way, just to be explicit, Medscape um, watchers. But I, he, Dr. Luther, talks about I think doses of spironolactone as high as four hundred milligrams back in the day, like it would actually suppress aldosterone secretion, but like you, no one actually does that in practicality and you'd be limited by side effects, but um, yeah, the doses can I, go fairly high, which I, you probably want to do in concert with a nephrologist or hypertension specialist. Yeah. I mean, I think, 
I guess maybe patients with cirrhosis are the highest doses I've seen of spironolactone nowadays. But uh, he did make the point too that you can actually follow the renin because the renin suppressed because there's so much endogenous aldosterone. And when you have the, the dose of the MRA high enough, you'll actually start to see the renin become not suppressed anymore. So uh, you can actually track that over time as well. Um, and also if they had a low potassium to begin with, the potassium will start to come up as you start to suppress the aldosterone enough, which is, is kind of neat. Um, Plarinone is the other one. It tends to have less of those uh, side effects like the anti-hormonal ones, gynecomastia for men, which he said you're starting to get at the doses of 100 milligrams or more in men, um, which can be a limiting factor. So a plarinone that he said is less potent. So he usually starts it at twice the dose. So uh, twice the daily dose of spironolactone. So if you were starting spironolactone at like 25 milligrams daily, it would be 25 milligrams twice daily of eplerinone, so 50 milligrams total. And uh, those doses might even go up to 200 to 300 milligrams a day. But the limiting factor there is uh, the package label says that, Paul, it only goes up to 100 milligrams, which I don't think I've had anyone on more than that yet, but I, it seems like I might need to. And uh, he said a dose up to 200 or 300 milligrams per day, you know, and sp split into twice a day dose might need to be done. So He's had some trouble with number one costs, and then or two, some pharmacists it seems like are not you know comfortable per, like administering that dose or, or, or being understandably that dose. squeamish about exceeding the, the recommendations. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so uh, so it's a tough one. Listen to the full episode because we really get into just a lot of really great nitty gritty details with a guest, and this is a topic, and I think is really important for us in primary care to have familiarity with, so we can work with our patients, recognize these things, and then, you know, know what our specialists are doing when we send them to the specialists. And Paul, I'd like to say that with all that, this has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Why do, would it shock you if I said yummy? Yeah, it would, it would definitely <laughs> shock me. It would delight me, Paul. Uh -huh. um, and so, Paul, with that almost uh, you you playing, playing along, I will say uh, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye.